Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Before we get into this week's topic, we just want to announce that this week's episode has been sponsored by our very own Dungeons of Drakenheim book, which is now live on Kickstarter. We've written a campaign for characters level 1 to 13 set in a ruined dark fantasy city based on our live stream Dungeons of Drakenheim. In the campaign, your characters will explore over 20 locations designed by Kelly and I set within this dark fantasy city filled with cosmic horrors and faction conflicts. It is a non-linear adventure that allows your player characters to ultimately decide the fate of Drakenheim for yourselves. So while it does follow the story that we explored in our original campaign, we've made it possible for you and your playgroup to go in a wildly different direction and there's no telling exactly how your campaign might end, what alliances they might create, what discoveries they might uncover, and what terrible dark magic and secrets that were not meant for mortal minds to know they may uncover. We have created a campaign that is really loaded with all the things that we love about tabletop role-playing games. There is action, there is puzzle solving, there's faction intrigue, lots of great exploration, and of course, an open-ended story where your players will drive the action. We are so excited to share this world with you, so please check it out now on Kickstarter where you can pick up the book and all the amazing accessories that we developed for this world. And now, onto this week's episode. So today, we're taking a look at part three of our subclass tier rankings for the Cleric in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. And specifically today, we are going to look at the new subclasses that were introduced for Clerics in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, specifically the Peace Domain and the Twilight domain. Now, the Order domain, which originally pe appeared in the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, has also been reprinted in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and while we did ask our community to rank that subclass again, just to see how close it falls to the previous one, it's not substantially different from the way that it was originally printed, so we are not going to review that one again. Check out our previous episodes for our thoughts on that subclass. If you look on the screen right now, you're going to see the criteria that we use to rank the subclasses. We have pitted the subclasses against each other and not those of other classes. We are also not taking multi-classing into consideration as a major component, although we might touch on it a little bit. As well, the roleplay and flavor that you are bringing to your cleric is not going to be accounted for in our rankings. Clerics can be roleplayed phenomenally and very differently depending on your style. More than just how well the subclass performs in combat, we look at how the subclass augments the features of the base cleric class and expands its capability to navigate through different problem solving, exploration scenarios, interaction scenarios, and much, much more. So while many of these cleric subclasses do bring a lot of power to combat situations, we do evaluate how they go outside of combat as well, because there's more to D&D than just swinging your sword around. So let's get started. For all of you peacekeepers out there, let's talk about the Peace Domain Cleric. And I think actually framing it in reference of Peacekeeper is very appropriate, because I think a lot of people look at the, the name of the subclass, which when it was coming through Unwrapped Arcana, it actually was renamed from the Love Domain to the Unity Domain, and now to the Peace Domain. And I think Peace carries with it a connotation that this is going to be a pacifist, which it is very much not. And I would also say to you that if, you're, if your character is not causing any damage in combat, but they are still buffing and healing people who are, you're not a pacifist, you're an accessory. Yeah, and I think I think the Peace Domain Cleric has a lot of abilities that advertise being the accessory to the damage being dealt. And yeah. I actually think that's the through line. They're throwing their biggest meat shields in the way of enemies and doing all sorts of things to make sure that they win the combat encounters. So your Peace Domain mm. Cleric can spread all the love they want while murdering their foes quietly. But if it was your blessed spell that caused the axe to slice through the neck of that goblin, was it you or the barbarian that slew him? Uh, as long as I say peace be with you as I do it, I think we're good. <laughs> so let's take a look at what the subclass grants you uh, as you level up. So like all cleric subclasses, you choose them at level one and you get the domain spells that are uh, a set of spells from first level to fifth level that are always prepared for you. So. With the Peace Domain, looking at the spells here, 
what is unique? What are we getting that we don't normally get as a cleric? Because that's what I always look for with a new domain. Really the only things on this spell list that aren't normally associated with a cleric are things like Rary's Telepathic bo uh, Bond, we have Autoluke's Resilient Sphere, and we have Heroism. But... <laughs> That's not that much. Yeah, because several of the spells on the spell list that aren't normally available to the clerics were added as part of the cleric's expanded spell list feature in Tasha's. So there's the Aura of Purity spell, which is now given to all clerics if you're using the Tasha's optional rules. Um, aid is also on here, as is Greater Restoration. Warding, Bond, Sending. There's a lot of spells on here that I like, but of all the spells on this list, the only one that I'm going to definitely 100% of the time cast every single day is aid and telepathic bond. I, I think that's that's the key thing here. Now, there is something to be said that by having some of these spells on your list, it means that you do not need to pick them up, so you have the opening to take other spells. However, I agree with you that overall, a lot of these spells, it's like, oh, that's nice, but I usually wouldn't have even picked them or thought of picking them. Yeah, and I think as... With this, you'll always find a way to use them, but I can see going through entire adventuring days not using many of the, the spells on the subclass. I don't think any of these ones are going to be a go-to spell for you that you would not have already. And the thing is that every cleric is probably going to bring aid anyways. Every cleric is going to want to have greater restoration anyways. So yes, that frees up your choices elsewhere, but it's not like many of the other cleric subclasses where you're getting a spell that clerics don't normally get, which is going to be like a spell that is going to be a game changer. Yeah, I think I want to give this spell list like a 3 or 4 yeah. out of 10. Yeah. Also at first level, you're gaining Implements of Peace, an extra skill proficiency in either Persuasion, Performance, or Insight. And finally at first level, you also gain the Emboldening Bond feature. This feature can be used a number of times per day equal to your proficiency modifier, and then when you use it as an action, you choose a number of creatures equal to your proficiency modifier, which can include you, and form a bond between those creatures which lasts for 10 minutes. For those 10 minutes, well, at least two of the bonded creatures are within 30 feet of each other. Whenever either of those creatures, once per turn, when they make an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, they can roll a d4 and add that to re the result. Here's the question. Would you rather use this ability or would you rather cast Bless? They stack. <laughs> that, that instantly makes this way better. Yeah, because here's the thing. This ability... You're, you're right in observing, oh, this ability is Bless. Uh, although Bless doesn't add to ability checks. It's only attack rolls and saving throws. And Bless is every single one you make. It's not once per turn. But I would like to note just a few things. First of all, they stack because this ability doesn't require the cleric to concentrate. So you can head this out and Bless at the same time. Which means that each creature basically on its turn, if they make one attack roll, they can add 2d4 to that attack roll. But the thing is, this is once per turn not once per round. So this means that when an enemy casts a spell, you can now add 2d4 to saving throws because it's the enemy's turn. That's the little secret in this text here is it says you can use it once per turn, but most saving throws that you're making are not happening on your turn. And if you are going to be doing an ability check and you know it's coming up, this also stacks with guidance. So if you have Bless down and you're in combat, you're reliably adding 2d4 to at least one of your attack rolls. It's like a plus five, basically. Yeah, and yeah. to your saving throws because they're not happening on your turn. If you're not in combat and you're doing a skill challenge, guidance plus this is meaning that you're adding 2d4 to all of your ability checks. So the way that this stacks with some of the staple cleric abilities and spells makes this way more powerful than it seems at first. And what's really important about this is that it's each creature can add the d4 once per turn. So that means that if your entire party gets fireballed, everybody still gets to use the d4s as long as they're within 30 feet of each other. So the, the And I think that's kind of what makes this accelerate, is that not only do the number of creatures you target increase with your proficiency modifier, but the number of times you can use it increases with your proficiency modifier. So once you've got that plus three proficiency, well, that's three out of four. Of the, like, if your party is four or five or six, you can very easily cover it. Now, you can't double up on this. So if you have a party of six, unfortunately, only half of them are going to be covered by this bond at any time. Because if you use the ability again, it ends on the existing ones. But it's really potent. And, and considering, I know we don't often talk about multi-classing, but it scales based on your proficiency modifier, which means that if you dip into the subclass with another class... <laughs> 
Yeah, you're going to get a you, scalable ability. You get the ability. full effect of this, yeah, with only one level in it. That's pretty nasty. Now, at level two, you're going to get your channel divinity power, uh, which is Balm of Peace. This is activated as an action. You get to move your speed, and anybody that you pass within five feet of which, when you scoot around, you can heal them for 2d6 plus your wisdom modifier. I just love the mental image of, like, I just have that 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 uh, mental image in my head of, like, someone coming down a line and high-fiving everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't imagine this ability without it seeming silly that you're like a field medic on steroids who's just running through a line of your injured folk being like, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, and just like rushing through. Yeah. Or the meme where like the, the, the water is pouring out of the jug and the guy just slaps the sticker on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, okay, so 2d6 plus your wisdom mod is like 10 points of healing. Yeah. Um, but it's as many as many people as you can tag during your your movement. So you could potentially get the whole party by like zipping in a you know zigzagging between them. Not a lot of healing, but it's cool because again you can combine this with a bonus action healing spell. So like if you got a bunch of party members that are dead on the ground dying bleeding out, you just go everybody get up, slap them all up, and healing word the person that you can't get get to. You know what I actually think makes this work better is the previous ability advertises the party staying within 30 feet yeah. of each other. Yeah. So if you are all staying near each other, it means that you are probably within range for quite a few of you mm -hmm. to get high-fived. Yeah, unlike the previous ability, um, this does not scale well at all. It's scale you only add your wisdom modifier to this, so it's never going to be... Basically... It's always going to be about 10 points of healing, depending on what your wisdom modifier is, which is basically like feeding everybody in your po party a healing potion. Which is still okay. Which, which is not bad. At higher levels of play, 10 points of healing might feel pretty meager. If you're bringing someone back up from zero hit points, 10 hit points of healing isn't even enough to guarantee that they're not going to get knocked down by the next fireball they get hit by. Yeah, it's still a pretty awesome ability, but it's not nearly as awesome as the other abilities this class yeah. gets. Yeah. At sixth level, you gain Protective Bond, which is an amplification of your Emboldening Bond ability, where now if one of your bonded creatures is about to take damage, another bonded creature can teleport in the way and take the damage for them. What's really interesting about this ability, there, there's a few things here. Number one, it doesn't signify that you need line of sight. So technically, even if you go around a corner and are about to get stabbed, you can have another party member teleport in. And I think that this works really, really well if you have a raging barbarian in your party. <laughs> Ironic that the raging barbarian would team up with the peace cleric because yeah, the raging barbarian has resistance to damage. And this doesn't specify that this isn't affected by anything else. Like, if you have some way of giving party members temporary hit points, they can jump in. The temporary hit points get soaked up from whoever has them. If someone in your party does have resistance to damage or any self-healing powers, you're going to get a bigger return on investment from this power because whoever has that their own innate damage mitigation is now going to be able to take the hit for the squishy wizard or the ranger or the rogue who can't or you know if it's a case where your frontline fighter is about to go down yeah someone who's got the hit points to take it could jump in and, and do it really weird use of this ability but i think that some people could cheese this and make this work if you have somebody who can do like climb a wall much easier than the rest of the party yeah they could climb up a large wall take a dagger and go to stab themselves <laughs> And then another party member who can't climb the wall very well can just teleport up, take the D4 of damage, and now you you have a free... Uh, you, you trade a little bit of life for a free teleport. It's cheese, but it's... it's, it's it so feels really cheesy. Like, the, but, but yeah, like, whenever you see you get to teleport, it kind of makes my eyes bug out because it's teleporting as a reaction. So there's so many ways that this ability could change the face of the battlefield because you could have a situation where someone else taking damage or causing someone else to take damage is allowing you to to bump around the battlefield in weird ways like i think that like a party that really developed a strategy around this could do some shenanigans i'm thinking of when, when i played a shadow monk i had so much maneuverability that my problem was i would get into the middle of a problematic area to try to hit the biggest target but then I'd be alone there but the thing is that I could run in as a monk to the middle of the battlefield against the biggest target and when I'm about to get hit pop goes the barbarian and now there's two of us I, well I know there's, there's this interesting thing where like a mobile character could scoot forward and if they get multi-attack twice 
So let's say that you just get stabbed twice by like a regular hobgoblin or an orc. Well, now two of your party members can spend their reactions to get in because that's two separate instances of damage caused just by one character being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But it's not the wrong place at the right time. It's the right time for everybody because you are using the excuse of taking damage to just reposition the rest of the party. I, there's, there, there's a really weird strategy here, and I, I think it's pretty game-changing. Yeah. Yeah. At 8th level, you gain potent spellcasting. Now you're adding your a wisdom modifier to your cantrips. So the Peace Domain Cleric gets a damage-dealing ability. At 17th level, you gain Expanded Bond. The range of your building bond goes from 30 feet to 60 feet, and now when someone spends the reaction to teleport, they have resistance against the damage that they absorb. So it's not just the Raging Barbarian not anymore. Just, yeah. Now everybody's a good candidate for teleporting in. This is a great subclass, and I think the implications of these abilities is outstanding. This is a subtle one, because I, I just say on my first read of this one, I was like, yeah, that's what a meager spell list. But then all the abilities are really good. Yeah, there, there's that one that we say doesn't scale well, but still, I, I, I argue that giving a free... Um, Giving a free healing potion to your whole party is still going to be useful, especially if you're in a TPK situation. So even its worst ability is pretty good. And its other abilities all complement each other so well, and it just builds on itself and has some shenanigan implications. Is this an S-tier subclass or is this an A-tier subclass? So it's it's tough. I, I feel like it's just just pushing over the S. It's like an S minus or an A plus. I feel like the the channel divinity is good but not great. The spell list kind of sucks. Like if this one had a really good spell list of spells that I really wanted to use a lot, and it has a few, but it just I don't hate the spell list. I just don't love it. Well, well, here's a question for you. Compared to the other clerics, now it's been a while since we've done the other yeah. cleric rankings, but we put the Forge, Life, and Tempest clerics in the S tier. Is the Peace Domain cleric presenting as good of a case or better than those clerics? It's not as good of a healer as the Life Domain cleric, but everything about it is bad. Like, the only thing that is actually lacking is heavy armor proficiency. Yeah. Right. And 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 all of those ones got heavy armor proficiency. And this one, you just get a skill, right? So that that's another thing that it does lack. But it's really good. And the the power, the emboldening bond power, is so good. And I think that that protective bond, the teleportation, has implications far outside of what it says on paper. And even the emboldening bond has implications beyond what is written if you pay attention to the subtleties. If we don't give this an S tier rate, rate ranking. I think we have to drop the other S tiers that we gave down to A. I think this deserves an S tier. Yeah. I Cuz I do think it's better than like the the Tempest and Forge are different. But like the Tempest and Forge clerics and even the Light Domain clerics, like all three of those ones, they feel like honest. They're like an honest to goodness. I'm a cleric. I'm doing everything. This 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 guy is like doing wacky things here with with its with its peace and hippie mumbo jumbo. It's kind of messing the whole system up. Yeah, there. yeah. He presents himself <laughs> as a peace domain cleric, but he's actually wrecking people on the battlefield <laughs> and pulling tricks that like no peaceful cleric would pull. But yeah. But I, I like this persona of, like, I am here to bring peace. Now, Barbarian, teleport over there and murder some people. Like, I love it. I, I think it's great. You know, one thing that I will say is the you know, the Peace Domain Cleric will elevate a good party that has teamwork already. But, like, this subclass is, like, you need to play as a team. You guys need to stay within 30 feet of each other because my key ability that bonds us all together means we need to work together as a team. And so if you have a group that is like, nah. I, I'm a I'm a shadow monk and I'm going 120 feet this way and I'm a gloomstalker ranger and I'm hiding back here in the shadows and I'm not coming to help you guys at all and I'm a raging barbarian rushing in I think your peace domain cleric is going to be very unhappy <laughs> yeah but I also think that by adding the peace domain cleric into a party and in informing the party of what your abilities are yeah. if the party sees the value in that it could actually promote teamwork yeah. so yeah S -tier? Uh, yeah yeah let's do it let's get okay. the S tier S tier yeah so, so now that we've given the Peace Domain an S tier, let's look at the Twilight Domain Cleric. For all of you astrologicals out there, uh, 
Let's look up to the stars to see what we are granted by this wonderful Twilight Cleric. We are going from the sunny ways of the Peace Domain Cleric into the Shadowlands, indeed, of the Twilight. So right away at first level with the Twilight Domain Cleric, you're going to get that list of domain spells. And I've got to say, compared to the other clerics that we've talked about, this spell list might be my favorite. You're going to get Sleep. You're going to get Fairy Fire. You're going to get Moonbeam. You're going to get Sea Invisibility. You're going to get Liamon's Tiny Hut. It's also got Aura of Vitality and Aura of Life, which are both pretty good. Greater Invisibility. But then Circle of Power and Mislead. This is an amazing... Eight of these spells are not normally on the Cleric spell list. This feels like this subclass is like, Hey, Trickery Cleric. Hey, Druid. I really like what you're doing over there. Mine now. Yeah, just took all of the like twilighty spells and was like, hmm, that feels like it belongs to me and that feels like it belongs to me. I, I'm going to give this spell list a 9 out of 10. Yeah. I think the only one that is a weak spot for me is the uh, Aura of Life. Yeah, it's not a bad spell by any means, but probably never going to be your go-to there. Getting Tiny Hut is like a great advantage for a cleric to have. At, at early levels, sleep is an awesome spell. You might not use it later, but at early levels, yes. And Fairy Fire is one of my favorite spells all the way through the game. Mm. It's it's always useful. There is a bit of redundancy with Fairy Fire and Sea Invisibility because they both let you see invisible, invisible creatures and then Fairy Fire also has the advantage on attack rolls thing. Yeah, but I, I will say that Sea Invisibility has had implications where I wish that we had it in yeah. moments, but yeah. we didn't. And so having it packed is pretty cool. Yeah, and I do think Circle of Power is one of those rare spells that's normally only on the Paladin spell list. Uh, and as a fifth level spell, it normally doesn't come online in the game at all until very high levels of play. Here you're getting it really early on. So it kind of shares that that with Destructive Wave of the Tempest Cleric, where it's like, hey, here's that really rare Paladin spell that you never see in play, and now you got it. And yeah. that, that it, Circle of Power is a great spell. Now, again, talking lightly about multiclassing, one of the great things about Clerics is the amount of stuff they get at first level. And let's look at the other options that you get for the Twilight Domain Cleric at first level. First of all, you get to gain proficiency in martial weapons and heavy armor. You're getting the complete package there, but you are also getting dark vision to a range of 300 feet. This ability is called Eyes of Night, and it lets you share the dark vision that you get to a range of 300 feet as an action uh, to a number of creatures equal to your wisdom modifier. And that now lasts for one hour, but you can only do that once per day. Still, in those rare cases where you have a party of stupid humans who can't see anything in the dark, uh, this is going to be key. But but straight up, it's also dark vision to a range of 300 feet. Most player characters that get dark vision only get 60 or 120 feet. So it's doubling the range of that dark vision, which can be really important in certain scenarios. Also, at first level, you get Vigilant Blessing. You touch a creature that couldn't can be yourself. That creature gets advantage on its next initiative check or unless you use this feature again. So you can only have one person that you're granting advantage on initiative to. Again, with the spell list and these three abilities, a one level dip into a Twilight Domain Cleric is pretty amazing. But let's look at what else you get for being a Twilight Domain Cleric. At second level, you're gonna gain your channel divinity feature, Twilight Sanctuary. And this creates a, uh, a sphere of twilight that is focused on you and goes out to 30 feet. It moves with you and it lasts for one minute or until you are incapacitated. But it does a few pretty key things. When a creature ends its turn within the sphere, you can grant it one of two benefits. It either gains temporary hit points equal to your cleric level plus 1d6, or you can end either a charmed or frightened condition on it. What's really crazy about this is that you can just keep replenishing those temporary hit points. It's an endless cycle of 1d6 plus your cleric level temporary hit points, which means that as you level up, this just gets better and better. And as long as people are staying within your channel divinity radius, uh, hits are basically being minused by that amount because you keep replenishing those yeah. extra hit points. Th this is a shield barrier for your whole party. While, while it's in play. And it's a shield barrier that's going to just keep regenerating as you go through the rest of the combat. And it doesn't require your concentration either. So you can have this in effect 
while you have one of your other really tasty cleric spells going down. Also, not to mention that although being charmed or frightened seems like the secondary option here, when one of your party members gets charmed or frightened, it is a nuisance to try to deal with yeah. that at the table. The ability to just nullify it because they manage to end their turn within 30 feet of you is going to be really clutch in the situations that you're dealing with Charmed or Frightened. So although this is a secondary option, adding that on the already amazing option of this Channel Divinity is just icing that will save combat encounters. And because Channel Divinity powers are replenished on a short rest, this does mean that at the beginning of the day when you're not in combat, you could activate this ability, let it charge up. Charge everyone up until they roll a 6 on their temporary hit points. Because those temporary hit points stay once this ability is gone. And it is worth rem reminding folks that temporary hit points don't stack. So if someone ends their turn in the Twilight Sanctuary and they still have temporary hit points from the last turn, they don't get, they can roll the D6 again and hopefully get more than what they got last time, but they won't stack up. They'll always go to whatever the highest thing that they rolled on that D6 was. At 6th level, you gain Steps of Night. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. And as a bonus action, you gain a flying speed for one minute. You need to be in dim light or darkness in order to activate this flying speed, but you don't have to concentrate on it, and now you can fly. And I think it's really important to note the wording here that says that as a bonus action, when you are in dim light or darkness, it's not you gain a flying speed while you are in dim light and darkness. You have to be in the dim light or darkness to start the flight, but then afterwards you can leave that dim light or darkness and continue flying. So the funny thing here, and this this actually reminds me of when I played my Shadow Monk who can teleport, where I was diving like under a table to teleport to under another yeah. table. If you're the cleric and you're in a brightly lit room, but there's like a shadowy spot, dive under that table and then soar out. <laughs> Uh, it's it's ridiculous, but technically it works. Yeah, or you know, you could just bring like a blackout blanket and like drape yourself under a blanket and start rising. <laughs> you could do the classic: uh, put yourself in a box. And yeah, now you're just yeah. flying around. <laughs> yeah, um, and I want to point out as well: this ability is one that this is one of the earliest concentration-free flight powers in the entire game. Yeah, and. This is on a class that also gets greater invisibility. At 7th so level, level. At 7th level, yeah. So at level 6, you've got concentration free flight. And at level 7, now you can cast greater invisibility on yourself. So you are now flying and invisible, creating a Twilight Sanctuary that is giving temporary hit points to all your allies while you are shooting guiding bolts and casting Toll the Dead. And you could even have a spiritual weapon down at the same time. Flying, invisible, spiritual weapon, Twilight Sanctuary, all simultaneously. <laughs> It's, it's ridiculous. The implications of this are ridiculous. You are flying Wrecking Ball, who is healing the party and saving lives and killing everything. And you can see 300 feet in darkness at the same time. Why not? And I mean, incidentally, you can also attack with your weapons while you're greater invisible because you get Divine Strike, which adds an extra 1d8 radiant damage to your weapon attacks. You're proficient in martial weapons, so go to town. Uh, one thing that you could actually do with this, even though you get heavy armor, um, you could go with a bow. And then you're flying around shooting. I also think that uh, this actually has good implications for the mobile feats so that you can hop in, attack people, and then fly away and just be bouncing yeah. around the battlefield attacking people and leaving. It's, it's so cool. And then finally at 17th level, we gain Twilight Shroud. And now any creature that is in your Twilight Sanctuary benefits from half cover, which is just a weird way of saying that you get plus two to your AC and your dexterity saving throws. Yeah, I... It's a weird choice to say calf cover because it masks what it's doing. Yes, maybe, maybe it means it doesn't stack, but I, I wish that it just had said creatures in your Twilight Sanctuary get plus two AC. That would have been way yeah. clearer. So I'm looking at this class. I think it's safe to give this a D ranking. No, I'm lying. I'm lying. Yeah. This is this is not only S tier. This is game breakingly S tier. I love I love this subclass. I I do too. It was. We ran it through in a couple of our one-shots. I think you were playing at like 4th and 5th level, so I don't think we really got to see the full power of it in play. Even at 4th level, it was the most fun I had in Untold Tales with a subclass. Yeah. Even using my channel Divinity was key. I, The problem is... the This is making it apparent. We, we recently did the Sorcerer classes. Now we're doing the, the, the cleric classes. And I think people have said that Tasha's Cauldron of Everything may have an issue with pushing power creep a little mm -hmm. bit. 
And I think we're really advertising that. This is so obviously an S, but it's so much an S that when we look at even the Peace Cleric, which is maybe a little bit lesser of an S, but it begs the question of the other Cleric subclasses. Do they all get demoted? And this isn't saying that any of them are bad. What this is saying is that the ceiling of our ranking has been pushed. Yeah. It's now higher. Because we, we do have to consider the subclasses relative to one another within the same class. And I can unequivocally say that both Twilight and Peace Domain clerics are far stronger than their player handbook counterparts and even the Forge Domain cleric. Like, I, I think it's no contest. Really, I... I yeah. Like, I, I think that they're all playable. I think the Life Cleric, I think the Tempest Cleric, and I think the Forge Cleric are all still awesome. But I think in light of this, this I think all three of them probably get bumped down to an A. It's, Which is comf a comfortable place for all of them to be. But there's no contest. Here. I mean, this, this starts to beg the question, A is really where we want our subclasses to land. Yes. S means that you may have started power creeping yeah. and yeah there are a lot of great subclasses out there that are s tier but a is actually the sweet spot and the twilight domain and the peace domain are kind of advertising this 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 small issue with tashes now when i say small issue i do want to say that like i love these i would play a twilight domain cleric in a heartbeat and not just because oh i want to be the most powerful cleric on the battlefield i think it's fun i think it's flavorful and i think the what you bring to the party is exciting i think that i would be yes. excited to help the party out with my abilities so i i think it's a really fun and great subclass it's just showing that fifth edition has kind of done this thing where it's slowly like inching forward mm. and forward to the point where now when we look at the player's handbook it's like do we need to go back yeah i i, I mean i don't know i i like where this subclass is going it's got lots of utility it's got some damage dealing it, it just kind of has lots of ways to help the party out in so many different ways and it's not a crazy damage dealer it's not a crazy healer it's just this whole package like there, there's no one thing about the twilight domain that makes you go, oh, that's too much damage, or oh, that's too much healing, except for, oh, that's a lot of temporary hit points. Like that Twilight Sanctuary is like, you drop that Twilight Sanctuary in a boss battle or a meaningful battle, and you you know that people are gonna stay alive. Yeah. You know that they're gonna stay up because that is the bastion point for everyone to, to, to congregate around. Now, I, I, I will say that I don't think we're trying to like sour on the Twilight Domain Cleric being yeah. too powerful. Although I have heard some people out there say that they are banning the Twilight Cleric in their games. Yeah. Yeah. And part of me says, I get it. I, w I wouldn't because I just think this is such a fun class. But if you have a Twilight Domain Cleric playing and you're the DM, like be prepared that this is a pretty game-changing subclass. It, it is. And I think, it, I think the interesting thing about this is that whenever you get a, a, a class that is stretching the bounds of power, the Twilight Domain exemplifies that subtle power of the Cleric. Because the Twilight Domain Cleric is not going to be the rock star damage dealer. It's not going to be the one that's like, I just dropped a force cage and trapped everyone in sickening radiance, or I'm the Gloomstalker that just did 150 points of damage. It's just going to be there like that amazing bass player in the band that is like laying down the beat, and it's like that bass is really thumping and is really the soul of the song. Yeah. And, and, but and the... And so it, it's not going to make the other players at the table feel bad, but you as a dungeon master are going to be like, how am I going to balance combat encounters now? If clerics are the bass players of the band, then the Twilight Domain Cleric is Flea from the Red Hot Chili yeah, Peppers. Yes, yeah, yeah. If you look on the screen right now, you'll see the final rankings we gave to all of the clerics. And let's see what the community thought of these two. 44% of respondents gave the Peace Domain an S tier ranking with 28.4% giving it an A, and 212 giving it a B, with 5% giving it a C, and a sliver for those D-tier rankings. Again, I think that this is obvious to most people that this is a powerful subclass. And that continues when we go to the Twilight Domain, but even more so, because 63% gave it a S-tier ranking, with 23 giving it an A, 10.5 giving it a B, and barely anybody giving it a C or D. I'm actually shocked that it even got 
B rankings. I, I but 60, 60, over 60% giving it an S tier ranking. Which is one of the biggest consensuses that we've ever had in the subclass tier ranking. Like the overwhelming recognition of the power of the subclass by the community is on par with the rankings that we saw with the Gloomstalker and the Divination Wizard. It is by far and away head and shoulders obvious it's power level. Both of these get an S from the subclass, but you can see in the community breakdown that I, I think that the Peace Domain Cleric, maybe maybe the Twilight Domain Cleric kind of stole the show. And so the Peace Domain Cleric has kind of been like, oh, Peace Domain, pacifist. I'm not even like, like, because with the Peace Domain Cleric, I think that you have to kind of do, you have to really read it and be like, oh. I think that when we look at these rankings and the way that I feel about the subclasses, it, the Twilight Domain Cleric is a capital S and the Peace Domain Cleric is a lowercase s. Yeah. Both are S's. There's no question about it. But the Twilight really raises the bar on what we thought clerics could be, which, again, could be a detriment to the rest of the cleric yeah. subclass. I think that with the right party dynamic, you could see that shift as well. So here is, again, our final rankings. You will notice that we repositioned some of the rankings because, again, the Twilight and Peace have just raised the bar so high that we need to account for that in our other rankings. Now, this is just our opinion, but in the community rankings that you see here, uh, we're going to leave them as they were. Uh, but I think that all of the A and S tier subclasses present really amazing options for the cleric. It's just that we need to take into account how powerful the Twilight Domain cleric is, and that it, that it could actually be a problem. Regardless, the cleric is one of the strongest and most interesting classes in Dungeons and Dragons. Well, I do think that the gap between the Twilight and Peace clerics and the others is noticeable, I think the other, the gap in power between the other cleric domains is really tight. When we threw out Bs and Cs, I think one thing that people need to keep in mind is that we're ranking the subclasses against each other and not those of other classes. So a C-ranked cleric is not the same as a C-ranked other class. Uh, yeah, like, if we were giving an absolute score, I think almost all the clerics would be A or better if we were ranking across yeah. all classes. So that that's something to bear in mind that they, they are really excellent in, in that respect, the, the overall cleric class. Clerics are just phenomenal. So if you're hoping to play a cleric, have fun. Pick the one that speaks to you and you're going to have a great time. But be aware that if uh, the Twilight or Peace Domains speak to you, they are game changing. So this has been a look at our Cleric Tier Ranking Part 3 in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Tell us about your thoughts on the Peace and Twilight domains in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider checking us out at our Patreon site by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more subclass tier rankings for the other classes in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.